generation, which is, I think we need, uh, the big question is where will we find tomorrow's leader? I talked with some of them during the break. Uh, some of the leaders will be in the next session. It's of course a matter of finding, and I know Philip Fuer will, will be a master in that, in finding this intergenerational dialogue, uh, in, in creating this intergenerational dialogue. We live in different world, we live in a world in which change is rapid. There is a difference between theory and practice. On a concept that I like a lot uh, from Nelson Mandela was the concept of leadership, but leading from behind. So creating a context and a culture for creating and cultivating the next generation of leadership or of leaders. The big question then is how to move from individual leaders to collective leadership. And leadership is, as the second book suggests, a collective genius. Uh, leadership is a marathon, not a sprint, but very quickly, uh, faster, higher, stronger, together. I mean, uh, let me invite uh, Philip Fuhrer from Inspired By on stage. I, I took a look at the website, and I should say founder and chief engagement officer of Inspired By. I took a look at the website, and I find particularly intriguing a white paper on sport and development and finance for development, I mean, which is on the website, which I recommend you to take a look at uh, later. So without further ado, uh, Philip Furrer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to pay tribute to Francisco because he's the only guy I know who dares to quote Charles Dickens in a sports conference. But you are not the first one, because I did quote A Tale of Two Cities 10 years ago in a meeting of the Union of Olympic Cities. So I invite you to talk about Dickens and Bleak House tonight around a fresh beer. I take your challenge to come up with great quotes, and I have a fantastic quote to introduce two youth sessions. That quote is almost 90 years old. It comes from someone who was passionate about sports, a true believer in youth, and he was very concerned about the future of youth back in the days. His name is Baron Pierre de Coubertin. He's the father of the modern Olympic game. And he wrote a speech. Well, he wrote a lot, you should know. But he wrote a speech for his 17th uh, birthday, 17th birthday in 32. And he read that speech at the University of Lausanne. And he had a message for youth. He said, youth likes to be told about the future, the coming society will be altruistic or will be nothing. Choose between that or chaos. 90 years ago, during the Great Depression. Today, hundreds of millions of kids have not been to school for a year or more. Some will never go back because they will stay in the field, helping the family. Millions of kids have been away from their sports clubs, away from generating social bonds with their friends. And the impact on um, on their physical health and psychosocial health is massive, so we're all concerned with the future of youth. So I thought that quote was quite amazing um, to, to be shared today. I'd like to call on stage for that first youth session, Hans and Natorp. We heard Hans welcoming us this morning. Thank you for joining us. And Jakub Kavinotsky, um, thank you very much for joining us on stage. We have also, uh, you can applause, yes, of course, please join. And we have on, uh, online Charlotte Kirk Elkier. Sorry for the uh, Danish pronunciation. Maybe you give me a, a bit of a help. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, she's live from Aarhus and she's going to speak after you two gentlemen. Please have a seat. First of all, Hans, actually, you can join the mic. Um, you heard, of course, that Hans is the president of the Danish National Olympic Committee and Confederation of Sports. He was also the uh, president of the Danish Sailing Federation, and he's a keen sailor who competed in the Olympic Games in 1988 in Seoul, if I'm right. That's correct. Excellent. Yeah. So you're going to tell us more about how you support clubs and schools, how you connect them. Um, a lot of us think or have a vision of uh, Denmark 
as being one of the most active and healthy communities in the world. Is this a myth? Are you going to break that myth a little bit? I'm sure you do have a problem also, a challenge with young people not being active enough. As you shared this morning, you alluded to that briefly, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philippe. Okay. Yes, I don't know if it's a myth, but I can tell you we live within the myth, at least. At least. We, we, uh, we believe that uh, we are very active and um, we are also very um, conscious about the fact that we need to work to stay active and stay in the forefront of this. We need to stay on the forefoot, basically. So thank you very much, everybody, to give me this opportunity to, uh, to share with you some of the Danish Olympic committees and, and Confederation of Sports perspectives on how we can have a more physical, active next generation. Well, we know that the next generation is less physical active. As we heard during the day, sport was basically the only thing to do when I was young, and many of us here were young. Sport was the thing to do. Now we have lots of other things that will distract us and, and pull us away from sport. So a study in Denmark shows us that 74% of the age group 11 to 15 do basically not live up to the recommendations of being physically active for at least one hour a day. We need to act on that. So in this presentation, in this talk, I will speak about how we in the Danish NOC work with the school as a driver for, more physically, for a more physically active next generation. Our aim is to get more and better sport and physical activity into the daily school, into the school day, and by that means to create a natural bridge between local sport clubs and the schools. So we believe that an active school basically is the basis for an active life, lifelong. In 2014, Denmark got a new primary school legislation. It states that all children in primary school must be physically active for 45 minutes on average every day. And since, ever since 2014, we have worked hard and relentless to get this legal requirement for the 45 minutes of physical activity implemented in all schools. It doesn't just go because it says so in the legislation. We do this by continuously emphasizing, of course, the legal obligation to incorporate active, uh, the physical activity into the school, in the daily routines of the school. Um, and also emphasizing the fact that children and young people lack physical activity and they suffer physically and mentally by basically sitting on their butt all day in the school. This is a political agenda, so we emphasize this towards the political decision makers, both nationally and municipally. We have learned three main drivers that will make the difference and support the implementation. Political support, financial support and administrative support. Political support means for us the willingness, basically the willingness to improve sport in schools must be anchored broadly in the political leadership of the municipality. It must be, they must have the ambition to do this. I mean, final financial resources speaks for itself. Uh, you need to back it up. And dedicated administrative staff is also crucial because we need local knowledge at the school to consolidate how to do this. So the teachers who work with sport in the daily, daily school routine, they know how to do. But the math teacher does not know how to incorporate physically activity into his lessons. And this is not just about taking 45 minutes out of the daily lesson plan and say now we jump in the schoolyard. 
This is about physical, being physically active in all different lessons throughout the day. The primary school legislation from, that was changed back in, in, in 2014 also states that schools are obliged to involve the surrounding community in order to create a varied school day and differentiate the teaching so in order to meet the needs of all children. We call it the open school. The open school includes collaboration between schools and local sports clubs. In the Danish NOC, in collaboration with national federations, with our members, our member federations, we work day by day to get as many schools as possible to collaborate with their local sports clubs in their communities. This can, for instance, be that the the school will visit the local boxing club during the school day, class by class, or the local boxing club's coaches can visit the school and give lessons in the sport lessons during the school day. We believe that building this bridge between the school on, the one, on one hand and the sports clubs on the other hand ensures a versatile, high quality physical education and that it strengthens the pupils' well-being mentally and physically. It strengthens their learning and the desire to move, to be physically active on a lifelong perspective in their spare time. And here again, we found, we found some learnings, some drivers that are key to implement this and make the difference. Finance, of course, the municipality must allocate finances. There must also be dedicated staff in the municipal municipality to coordinate, and we need to build sport facilities. So what about the finances? Um, we need, basically, to buy the sport coaches free from their civilian jobs, because much of the coaching in Danish sports clubs is done on a volunteer basis, and this is during working hours. Um, we, need, we need to make sure that the, the coordination between the schools and the sports clubs are done on a professional and, and well-coordinated basis. The cooperation between the sports clubs and the schools must, be, must be, be done by the local municipality, or at least not by somebody in the sports club. And every time we build a new school, we need to build sport facilities connected to the school. And when we do this, we also must remember to build facilities for the local sport clubs. This can, this can be as basis, basic as a locker, but in the good situation, we, we basically make room for a clubhouse when we build the school and we build the sport facility. So we also have created the room for the club environment and the culture, which is key to make this, um, to, to, to make it last beyond the school day. Um, on the side of this, we, we, work, we work to um, improve the teacher's professional education. We work to strengthen the education in sport and physical activity directly into the teacher profession education. By raising the level of teaching in sport and physical activity, we believe that we will create more and better physical activity in the schools on the long term. This is an ambitious long-term work. We also run projects um, which are more specific on sport for sport itself. We run the School Olympic, School Olympics is the Danish School Olympic movement which brings schools and sports clubs closer together. Through teaching materials, fun events, team competitions, complete classes, classes they, they participate in common. 
the School Olympics will give our, our pupils a magnificent and best experiences with sport we can, we can by any means give them. The School Olympics create more and, and, and better sports in school. This, it strengthens the community and the classes, inspires sports clubs, and it creates the basis again for, this, for succeeding in, in lifelong physical activity, both inside and outside organized sports clubs. So to wrap it all up, in Denmark we are pleased to have the need for daily physical activity and cooperation between school and sports clubs um, written into the primary school legislation. However, there is much work to be done to implement this, to make it happen, to make the physical activity and open school happen in daily life. There are several ways to go, and we are constantly becoming more knowledgeable about what works and what doesn't. And I hope you can take some inspiration away from, from my speech here, and I'm very eager to elaborate and answer questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hans. Just, I have one question, maybe in two parts, before we move on to Jakub, and we have a great, uh, a great link to active learning with Jakub in a moment. Um, a lot of people in the different cities and countries have observed the drop in participation due to COVID, and depending on the sports and the clubs, sometimes it's 5%, 10%, 20%, um, for financial reasons or social reasons, etc. Et et so the retention rate is really a challenge for clubs and, and federations. What do you do to support your clubs and federations in that current situation? And also, what do you do to make sure that they are as inclusive and open as possible, i.e. maybe a little bit less competitive for some of the kids who are not at this level of competition? Because we know the dropout in teenagers is very much due to the highly competitive environment in traditional clubs. So how, how do you play that fine game right now in supporting federations and the whole sports uh, fabric? So if I understand you right, I think the, 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 the question here, the challenge, is yeah. not about level of competition. It's no. more about giving access to clubs. Yeah. Yeah. And we lost approximately 90,000 members across all federations in Denmark out of 1.92 million members. Um, I'm convinced we'll get them back. What worries me more is that many of our volunteers and in, in the Danish NOC alone we have in, as an umbrella, we have half a million volunteers driving the sport in the clubs. Many of them have found other daily business, so to speak. So we need to bring the normal back, mm -hmm. and we, we need to focus on to make this very, very easy. No new uh, rules, no new systems, just plug it in like it was. They, they really need to, to go back to daily routines. Mm -hmm in the sports clubs and, and, the, and the, key, the key challenge here is to get the volunteers back, basically. Very nice, thank you for, for that uh, tip and feedback. Please have a seat back, Hans and Jakub, the floor is yours. Um, briefly introducing you as um, the president and co-founder of V4 Sports Foundation. You tell us more about this in a minute, but maybe the best way to describe you is to say that you think, breathe and dream active and healthy lifestyle, or you are a pride fighter against sedentary behaviors. Is that the right way of Yeah, describing I would like your... to think so. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that introduction. <laughs> um, and Hans, thank you for your address. Uh, I could not think of a better uh, way to start my presentation today. So yes, my name is Jakub. I do come from Poland, uh, and I'll be very uh, delighted to talk with you about something what we call the disruption in education. And what I mean, uh, what I mean by that, I will go into details in a moment. I, I think I need a clicker. Yes, sorry. Just the green one here. Um, so before I go into details, just to uh, give you a bit of my background. Um, so uh, I'm wearing a few hats actually uh, on the international level. I'm the executive committee member of two global organizations. One is the Active Healthy Kids Global Alliance and the International Sport and Culture Association, which just happens to be around the corner here in, uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, and also on the national level, I'm the V4 Sport uh, Foundation president, and this is actually my full-time job. But I'm also uh, the member of the Rural Sport Committee in the Polish Olympic Committee. And very recently, I have co-founded the uh, Crockett and Lama uh, Academy, which is my other full-time job at the moment. Um, 
So I've been involved in the educational space for over a decade now, uh, mostly through the design, the development and implementation of different projects and programs aiming to decrease sedentary behavior amongst the youngest kids and increase physical activity. Uh, so if you were there in uh, Sports Summit, uh, sorry, Smart Cities and Sports Summit in Tokyo 2019, you might have heard my presentation on how we have used gamification, storytelling and new technologies in order to increase physical fitness levels amongst 86% out of the 10,000 kids who have participated in our, in our intervention. Uh, so I had the pleasure to write a short article for Healthy Cities. Uh, but also uh, that, that project uh, uh, has uh, appeared in a report for European Commission early this year, uh, a report that was mapping innovative practices outside of the regular sport world. But that's history now, I want to say. Uh, so in March, uh, 20, uh, March 2020, last year, when COVID came, uh, all of our uh, projects and actions were stopped from one, one day to another, uh, which, was, uh, which had the downside, meaning we couldn't deliver the programs, the projects we were working on for so many years uh, uh, in the same way we did. But it also had an upside, and the upside, the biggest upside of it, was we finally had the time to stop think, reflect, and re-evaluate re everything that we've been doing for the, task, uh, for the past 10 years with a very, uh, uh, um, say, very actual uh, goal. Uh, we d d tried to come up with different ways to help the kids who were sitting sedentary at homes uh, during lockdown and help them to be more physically active, but also in the short term, in the short run, uh, we tried to develop new initiatives that would be more sustainable and, say, COVID-proof. Uh, uh, COVID uh, so we dug, dug really deep and uh, for that reason, the long-lasting reason, the sustainability, we've kind of evaluated the whole educational system as we all know, uh, probably. Uh, we went back to 200 years in history and uh, some, some of the key findings we've found, you know, uh, the school environment has changed uh, a lot uh, over the past 200 years. Uh, we no longer use the uh, analog bells, there's electric, electronic bells, even playing music for the kids during the breaks. Um, I'm sure many of you would remember chalkboards that we used to use in schools. Uh, today, they are being replaced by multimedia boards with access to the internet and providing totally different experience for the kids in the classrooms. Um, the books are no longer black and white. Uh, they are colorful. Uh, uh, there's a great variety to choose from uh, as they got uh, cheaper, they got mo uh, more um, uh, accessible. And we no longer have to go to school uh, to learn to study. Uh, uh, this was the basic premise that the, uh, the, uh, the knowledge was in schools, so the teacher knew things that he was teaching the kids and the books were at school. Uh, today we can access everything we would like to uh, uh, learn or need the information for from anywhere in the world. All we need is a device and internet connection. Um, what also has changed, uh, 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 we have uh, uh, our gyms look uh, very much different than what they used to, uh, what they used to, uh, what they used to uh, look. Um, but also not only the school environment has changed, the kids, uh, the kids at schools have changed. Uh, in 2020, meaning last year, we had uh, nearly 40 million overweight and obese kids around the world, and this is uh, the kids uh, until five years old. Between five and uh, 17 years old, we had 360 million kids who have suffered from uh, overweight and obesity. Uh, the same applies to uh, poor postures. Uh, there's been some research done around Poland, but not only in my country, that proves that over 75% of the youngest kids in kindergartens have posture problems at the very early age because of sedentary lifestyle and uh, um, insufficient physical activity, which results in many different problems, as we all, uh, as we all know. But um, there's one fundamental thing that hasn't changed since 200 years, and this is the basic premise that the kids, in order to learn, need to sit quietly at their desks, just like we are all doing today. Um, and this is something that not only uh, didn't change at school, but it's also the premise that the kids doing their homeworks have to go home and sit quietly at their desks to study. Um, and this also is really uh, interesting that that hasn't changed for so, for so long, uh, even knowing that since 1980 there's uh, a growing body of, uh, of knowledge around how physical activity uh, activates the brain, how physical activity develops kids' brain, and how physical activity uh, improves, uh, has a very short-term effect on kids' behavior in class, so focus concentration, but also long-term improvement in terms of the uh, brain development. 
So we took all these pieces together uh, during COVID era, uh, all the problems, the possible solutions, the best practice we had. We decided that we want to disrupt the education, meaning we want to question the status quo. Uh, uh, we believe that uh, there's not one single topic at school uh, that kids have to learn only while seated. And our goal today, uh, today uh, we'll not be, not, not be talking about tomorrow, but our goal, uh, our goal today is to develop the four curriculum of uh, kindergarten kids and early education classes one through three, but the kids instead of the books and, uh, uh, and workbooks will be using different materials in order to learn math, geography, languages by being physically active. So how do we do it? Um, we've started by taking best examples from the field where when education works the best, this is when education is combined with uh, entertaining form. Uh, which is called, and that is, this is not our term, this has been around for some time already, it's called the edutainment, so uh, combining education and entertainment makes the kids engage in what they're doing. And one of the uh, examples, and I'm sure you all know that one, Sesame Street was one of the first attempts uh, uh, to create an edutainment content. So what we've decided, uh, we've decided to put a third layer to edutainment, and this is movement. So that's, why, that's how we've come up with the Crockett and Llama, uh, Crockett and Llama Academy, um, which uh, provides the kids the, the possibility to be physically active uh, in school more. During those classes, like you, Hans, said during, uh, during the school day, the math teacher doesn't have to know how to get uh, kids physically active, but we can provide them with materials so they can learn, uh, for example, the multiplication table by being physically active. Uh, as this is attractive for me, we do consult this with the kids. So I'm actually, uh, I said I have two full-time jobs because I'm, I have an eight-year-old son who is within my target group and uh, he's my, well, I'm, I, either he's my employee or I'm his, that depends on, you know, on the status. Uh, so uh, he provides an instant feedback and, and other kids as well. So, and uh, getting kids physically active in the classroom for those math teachers, geography teachers, science teachers, uh, helps them uh, to keep, uh, keep, keep kids uh, concentrated. Um, so, we believe that the future of education starts today and we believe it's a really good moment. Uh, what we've learned from the teachers uh, is that uh, they, are, they, they are seeing uh, uh, and experiencing extremely big problems that derive from, uh, from uh, long periods of lockdown, from sedentarism, that the kids have to reunite and, um, and have to, uh, they have to come together. Uh, so they understand why is it for. We believe that if we had uh, um, uh, started this uh, uh, project in pre-COVID era, that wouldn't get so much, uh, so much attention. So what we're doing these days, we have um, a built a platform with well over 200 different videos around different topics so far. And every month there's 10, 15 more videos coming up. We are designing active homework. So it's not a homework anymore, it's an active homework. So kids can, uh, can go home and uh, do their homeworks with their parents with their peers. We're also working quite a lot on uh, getting kids outside of the, uh, uh, outside of the schools and uh, being outdoors and uh, the different way to encourage them to do so. Uh, we have over 1,000 uh, uh, people who are using it, so registered on the platform. Uh, but also we have started joining forces with different local governments, with different uh, cities in Poland, and they want to provide the possibility for all of the teachers within their uh, municipalities to use uh, these tools. Uh, so, so that would make, so I would like to say that there's uh, quite a few of them who have already uh, jumped on board, and we will be having at, uh, around 2,500 teachers uh, using that platform in the next, uh, at the beginning of the next year. And this is a very special day. I didn't know that up until yesterday when I was uh, looking up uh, on our YouTube channel. YouTube channel we use just for, to publish some of the content we are uh, uh, putting on the, on the platform. Today we are, uh, Crockett and Lama is actually celebrating its first, first birthday on the YouTube channel. Uh, it's exactly the 23rd of November when we, when we launched it. Uh, so uh, we were very happy uh, uh, about having uh, more than one, one 1,800,000 views already, so over 60,000 uh, hours uh, uh, um, our videos were watched. So we're very, very happy with that. And uh, with this, I wish happy birthday to Crockett and Lama. And I'm not sure, and I uh, uh, hope you liked it, and I'm not sure if I, we have a time for a short video. I think our audience uh, is very attentive. Uh, thank you very much for the content, but I think they've been sitting for too long. Okay, that's so good. I suggest you give it a shot, right? Okay, so uh, <laughs> I'll just give you, uh, so we have a short video, it's about two minutes, minutes long. Uh, it's, 
it's not the educational uh, per se video uh, because that's in Polish for now. Uh, so I've, uh, we've put up. Uh, uh, we, I want to propose you a brain break, which does not have to that uh, uh, you do not have to understand what is happening. There's no talking, but there's a bit of movement. So I ask you kindly to stand up, uh, and let's uh, let's actually walk walk the talk. I'll come down to do it with you. I'm not sure if the video is working. It should be working. They should be ready to launch it. So I invite you to make to make some room around you and just to follow follow the movement that is being on the screen. We are the guinea pigs. Uh. Well done. W wanna show it more? <laughs> ah, jumping. Well done. I hope you guys online uh, did the same at home. Thank you very much for that break, active break. And um, we'll move on to the third speaker, who's going to join us online, Charlotte. Um, so Charlotte. Kirk Elkier is the stopover director for the uh, Ocean Race in 23 in Aarhus. I hope you can hear us, Char Charlotte. We can't see you, but give it a shot. I can see yes. You. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. You're the floor welcome. is yours for, for 10 minutes. But maybe the first thing to say is to explain what a stopover director is for such a race. <laughs> And we'll hear more, thank you, because it's going to complement what we've heard this afternoon in terms of engaging youth, leverage, leveraging on an event, and working in building a partnership between a host city, an event owner, an event organizer, to engage youth, including on sustainability themes on the SDGs and getting them actively involved, including in a youth summit. So you have lots of great content to share. Thank you very much. You're welcome and welcome virtually to, to Aarhus. So I'm about um, 300 kilometers uh, away from you in, in Copenhagen. Yes, and I'm Charlotte and I work for the city of Aarhus. Uh, we have our event department called Aarhus Events. And for the Ocean Race Stopover, we are actually the city, are the main organizers. And in that regard, I am then the stopover director, which is the person who is leading the project. Um, moving it forward, developing it, and making sure that it all happens uh, in Aarhus together with, with great partners. Um, 
Oh, sorry. There we go. So what I'll be talking to you about today is from a city perspective. First of all, I'll just briefly mention the strategic view that we have on events in Aarhus and hopefully be able to inspire you things that you can do in your own cities. I will briefly touch on the holistic approach that we have when we are developing initiatives for events such as the Ocean Race Stopover. So, so for events that are so big that the city itself is the organizer. I will touch on the goals that we have for the Ocean Race Stopover here in Aarhus. And then, of course, um, spend some time on the youth initiatives that we are doing. And these initiatives are mainly around sustainability and the green tech transition that we're in. So not so much getting the young people actively involved that we have just heard the, the former two speakers, but also how we are uh, working on education and how they are working with the youth in regards to developing the, the whole event. And then we'll have some, some questions. Um, in the end, actually this morning, and the reason why I can't be with you in Copenhagen is because we just had 24 students from our business academy working all day out in the cold here in Aarhus, working on uh, the this, this stopover and trying to develop the physical framework and giving the tasks of what do they as youth see in, in important. So we are, we are already in it uh, in, in Aarhus. In Aarhus, we have a very strategic view on the events that we do. We have our second event strategy in the city. Um, the, the, former, uh, the previous event strategy, sorry, was uh, adopted by the city council in June last year. This gives us the overall framework on what we have to focus on when we are uh, attracting events. That could be all types of events. It also gives us a framework on when we are developing events that are in our city. Uh, and mostly it also gives us the framework what we have to do when we are executing and when we are host ourselves. In Aarhus, the city of Aarhus are mainly being the host on things such like the, the Sailing World Championships uh, back in 2018, hence remembers that very clearly, I know. Um, and also when we are doing, for example, the Torships races, um, celebrations of the Queen, and now the stopover. And it is events that are mainly very open to the public. There are no um, entrance fee, no ticketing, but where the city has a strategic role, that's when we as an event organization take the responsibility. The event strategy here in Aarhus has a wide um, scope, um, but some of the main things that we have to focus on in general for everything that we do is of course sustainability. It's very much on top uh, of everything that we, we do. We are a collaborative city. We are a second city, so we are not we are not too big and we are not too small. We have a lot of uh, contacts in the city. We have a lot of contacts in in the in the country. Um, we have to co-create and create networks in all those events. There are five and a half uh, full-time employees, so that is not a lot of people when you are delivering an event like the Ocean Race that I'll get back to briefly. Entertainment, you'll see the word again. We are working very highly with that because, of course, we have to entertain people, but we also have to educate them. So I was pleased to see that on Jakob's slide as well. And then also we use events that the city are in charge of to also develop new urban areas, especially on our harbour front. So we are activating the areas before people move in or during the, the process of being, things being um, built, especially in, in new urban areas. So the event strategy is really a focus one. We, it's come out of our office and of course we have to be the first ones to, to implement it. When we have events that are mega events like the Ocean Race is for us, um, and when we are developing the initiatives and looking into what type of initiatives do we need to focus on being the host city, we actually take quite a holistic approach to begin with and then we sort of, you know, you narrow your initiatives down, we look at what are the international and the national goals. So within sustainability, we look very much into, of course, the sustainable development goals. We also look into where is Denmark placed? Where do we have some opportunities? Where do we still lack to perform? And we look at how can we use an event to actually push some agendas forward? Because we know that when we are doing events, we have for a very short time, sometimes, you know, a week, two weeks, but then we have massive exposure and we have a huge platform. So if we can use the power of events that we call it to actually push forward agendas, that is what we want to, to do. 
We also look into our regional, um, we have five regions in Denmark, our, our region strategy. In this case, they have a big focus on mobility and also getting especially the youth to use uh, public transport more. We still need more youth to use their bicycles and not have them or have their parents buy them a car as they immediately as they turn uh, 18. So the regional focus is also something that we look into. We, of course, has a, have a fo big focus on our own city's focus um, and green focus, especially on um, CO2 focus. Um, and then also as a visit region, as a visit Aarhus region, of course, the tourism aspects are important for us to, to, to look into. So that is sort of the, the overall, the event strategy and these sort of holistic uh, approaches we, uh, we take into account when we do um, a big event. Some of you may not know quite what is actually what is the ocean race. And just to to just briefly mention that before I move into our initiatives, it's around the world uh, race that has been uh, sailing around since 1973 um, for many, many years, the Volvo Ocean Race. It's two boat classes now, previously only one boat class, now two boat class, the VO65 and the Yamokas. And we are eight iconic host cities and it's the first time ever that we are hosting one in Denmark and it makes us very proud that it is that it is Aarhus that will be the first Danish um, stock over we do believe that we have quite a position within sailing in Denmark in in our city it's a 400,000 expected visitors event huge budget for us at least 6.4 million euros so it really is a mega event and we of course have to use that mega platform to execute our own event strategy, but we also have to use it in order to push uh, some a lot of those agendas and initiatives and, and policies that are uh, out there. This is a big slide. I won't go too much into into it, but I'll just mention to you that the way that we work with it strategically in Aarhus, having the event strategy, having all of these national, regional, and local strategies, we very early on move into making a document with our strategy for the event, the goals for the event and the actions that we need to take. And I just want to highlight a few things in this because of course we have to attract a wide audience and we have to be a good tourist destination, but we also have to, uh, to develop initiatives between sport and business. And we have to make sure that we are discussing climate change and the green transition. And when you look down in, in the bottom on the green there, we have committed to very very early on and we want to develop initiatives that are of course that are focusing on sustainability but also with education as a very big um, um focus point we know that in order for our children and youth to take care of the ocean that is our play field on this event they have to have good experiences with the ocean we have to get them out in the water they have to try it they have to taste it and they have to to to, to breathe it um, so, so that is why education for us is is key. Um, having then make sure that we have the goals and the strategy, uh, we needed to decide on in or what type of sort of handles can we use that are new and where can we activate and where can we sort of what can we frame our initiatives around. What we have chosen in Aarhus in order to be able to, to make youth initiatives that I will just revert to in a, while, in a little bit is that we've decided to create a physical place right in the heart of the event village and we will call it Sustainability Island. It's a part of the pier in the event area, it was, but it will be 100% dedicated to initiatives that deals with sustainability. And as you can see on the slide there, we have yellow marks and we have blue marks and a purple mark. And this shows that on this piece of, of, uh, of the event venue, we will mix business solutions with youth engagement and learning and playing activities. So a company will be standing right next to a museum or a cultural institution or a sports club. Um, and then jointly, we will make sure that our audience has this um, edutainment uh, experience when they come down to the pier and the business people will also have an, uh, an, an experience of seeing children working with specific topics uh, on this sustainability island. So creating a physical 
space for us has been quite important because it's it's something that we can work with and it's something that we can talk to companies and, and our partners around. You see that there's a, a purple uh, circle there saying Youth Summit. And the Youth Summit, we will engage the youth at the Sustainability Island, but the idea of a Youth Summit comes from the Ocean Race have what they call an Ocean Race Summit. Many of the federations have something that they bring to the table when they come to a host city. It might be an annual meeting or a seminar or a summit. And in this case, the Ocean Race do this uh, one day, half day um, summit. But in Aarhus, we are a young city, we are a student city. We said, well, let's take the opportunity and create a youth summit um, for the youth, by the youth and the youth discussing sustainable solutions. We do really think that's the way forward, that they also have a voice. On the sustainability island, you saw the yellow, the yellow mark saying learning and, and playing. And what we are doing here is tapping into the school system. Like Hans said, we still have a have a way to go for the for the open school to still happen within the the sporting things. But on on this occasion, we're actually creating a program for especially children within the junior middle schools so from age eight to 13, 14, 15. We are creating a program for these children and their teachers together with the 13 partners that all has a STEM focus. These pictures are from a workshop we did with these 13 partners just recently. And the partners are, for example, the Museum of Energy, the Museum of Natural Sciences, the United Nations Youth um, Service. All of these people who normally in their everyday life has a really strong um, school program at their own institution. So we, we say to them, OK, what can you provide into a before program? What can you what can teachers dig out and say, well, we want to learn about wind or we want to learn about the ocean. Then we use material from these partners. But the main thing is we say to these partners, you have to be present during the event in Aarhus in 23 at the event site. So all of these school kids can then go in and meet these partners and activate and learn about it. Because as I said in the beginning, these children need to taste it and feel it and, and smell it in order for them to remember the experience that they are giving. So together with these partners, we are creating a learning environment during the event. What is great with working with partners such as museums and learning institutions is that they are really, really expert in in talking to students in the morning and then in the afternoon, they speak to the families and the parents. And these are our audience on an event in the weekend. So we we, we, we do two things in, in one here. Um, looking into the program for our higher education and some of the youth that I was together with this, this morning, the way that we are working with youth is that we are involving them already in the development of the we are involving them in designing the youth summit. So what should a youth summit be? We, we just said to these students, these are students from the Aarhus University saying, how should we do it? What do you think is the best way? So they are actually working with the design. It's not us who are above 40 uh, who will come and say what the youth should talk about. Also designing the sustainability island, the, 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 the drawing that you saw with the yellow and the, the blue marks today, they have been walking around and we've said to them, what should make you come? What, what makes it interesting for a company and a partner to be part of this physical place? So they are also part of designing uh, the, the sustainability island. All of this is what we call we're educating them in the power of the event because we do believe that the power of the event is when we as cities use it for much much more than just delivering a 14 day um, event so they are being educated well when you have 400,000 guests of course you have to you have to communicate to them but they have to be giving tools on how to do that and that is combined with the green experience economy and this is also where this is where the value for the city really comes in that we can see that we are gaining long time um, effect. This is just a very a, a sum up of some of the activities that we are doing on the higher education. So we started already in the spring semester, uh, spring 21, with uh, the students designing our uh, the, the youth summit. How should we how should we move uh, forward in that? 
where we are just now is in the autumn semester developing this. We've developed this elective where they are focusing on the sustainability island and also creating the youth um, summit. And then we go back again, more designing, more electives. Um, and then slowly when we get to the spring of 23, um, we will have a really, really, uh, hopefully a very good summit, but also a, a summer school inviting the whole world uh, to Aarhus to learn about the, the way that we have, have done things. And these are just some for, for some pictures for you in the top there, the, that was last year when we had still had to wear the masks. These are the youth that are, were working on designing the, the youth summit. Uh, presenting ideas to us on how we we should do that, and the, the last the two bottom pictures are just from last week when we have these students on the elective, and we had a live talk from uh, Megan Jones from the Ocean Race, who is their sustainability director. We had her uh, communicating live to our students, telling about why is it so important, what what is the role of the Ocean Race. So we are we are building knowledge upon these students, making sure that they are well uh, educated when they reach the reach the the workforce and have to work with events that's it <laughs> very much thank you very much charlotte <laughs> charlotte you should know that we are the only thing standing between the audience and the break um so i'll, <laughs> I'll throw you a quick question um a tricky question maybe, but I'm sure you have a great answer. How do you measure success? Uh, what are your indicators over the coming years up until summer 23? Is it participation, retention, number of projects that are being designed and submitted? I mean, what, what are your key indicators? Just curious. I, well, first of all, we go back and look into if we have reached our goal. So we make sure that we always look back to saying, OK, we wanted to create initiatives around sustainable solutions so our the way that we look into it's it's very it's it's quite a broad a report we do after we finish but we are always looking back into what was the goals that we needed to reach so within education then we say okay how many students did we actually manage to educate within the creating the learning environment we are we are looking into how many different types of partners did we manage to get on board creating this physical space at the sustainability island. Uh, my goal is we have to have 100, 100 partners to deliver this big and small. Um, so it's sort of the soft things that we are looking into. And then, of course, we do guest analysis. Did the guests at all like the experience that they have? And we evaluate with the students. Did they get did they benefit from it? So it's so much not so much numbers. It's more knowledge that we are measuring on. Thank you very much, and, and a fantastic example of how a city can leverage an event to, to design some pregacy and legacy, especially focusing on youth. So thank you for sharing that. A quick question to Jacob before we break. Um, with your innovative ideas um, on disruptions, when you go to headmasters, schools, cities, or Ministry of Education, how do people react? I mean, do they buy in? How do you sell your stuff, your new ideas and new ways of, of education? What, what is your spin to actually convince them to change? I think we have a pretty good different sets of arguments for whomever we talk to. Um, and then there's different arguments when we approach the teachers themselves. There are different sets of arguments when we approach the school principals. And there are different sets of arguments when you speak to local government. And I think the part of the success, why this is happening, is that we have managed to find the language that these specific groups speak and to address their needs within the space where we're working in. It's not always easy. Mm. There are many challenges. As you saw in the picture, uh, well, the educational system is one of uh, those subsystems within our society that has not experienced that much change in terms of the fundamental um, assumptions or the basic premises. So it's not easy to, to break it. Uh, we do not intend to break it, but we intend to get as many people as possible on board and to break it together. So this is our approach in that sense. Thank you very much. Uh, Hans, Jacob, Charlotte, thanks so much for sharing uh, your, your content, ideas, observations, and recommendations this afternoon. So in that session, we looked at engaging youth, we looked at youth as 
a recipient as a target group in terms of education, in terms of engagement on the SDGs, etc. The next session will go deeper in youth engagement. We'll look at empowerment, at leadership, at the identification and, and mentoring of young talents in the community. And that should be interesting for every city because you have young talents everywhere just waiting to be empowered and entrusted to contribute to a better world. So stick with us. We have a break until half past, so be back at uh, half past four. And we have a little surprise with two Olympians from Denmark coming and sharing their experience from last summer in Tokyo. Thank you very much. Thank you.